perspective in uh, more general. And then I would like to introduce one really crucial aspect in sustainability transformation here in the Baltic Sea region. This is our um, our uh, relations to Myers, to peatlands, to bogs, so to organic soils, wetlands. And I will show you that it is of crucial importance for the sustainability transformation in the region to use these peatlands in a sustainable way. And that's what is not uh, um, given by the current uh, common agricultural policy of the EU. So I would like to combine this regional perspective, Baltic Sea region, agricultural policy, especially with regard to peatlands and the EU perspective. And so I wanted to, what I wanted to do first, and unfortunately I cannot show the slides now, but I will do so in a couple of minutes. I wanted to show you that um, the sustainability is in the core of this regional cooperation here in the Baltic Sea region almost since oh, or since almost 50 years. Um, when you or when we would like to go back to the 1970s, uh, then we have the situation in the Baltic Sea region that we have NATO member states in the West. Warsaw Pact member states in the east and the neutral north in, in Scandinavia. And the member states understand in already in the 1970s, we cannot protect the ecosystem Baltic Sea without any cooperation. It's only possible by a cooperation. It's almost enclosed sea, Mediterranean Sea. Um, and the only way to protect this really fragile ecosystem is to come together. And so already in the 1970s, uh, states from the East and the West come together on regional level to cooperate and they signed the so-called Helsinki Convention. And it was the first convention worldwide where states from the East and the West, communist state and capitalist state came together to cooperate on regional level uh, on such sustainability issues here in the Baltic Sea region. And then, in, for example, there were a lot of other steps uh, towards uh, sustainability transformation here in the region. And one important step, for example, was in, the, uh, in 2009, where the EU adopted the first macro-regional strategy, the strategy for the Baltic Sea region. And again, sustainability transformation is in the very heart of the strategy. So what I would like to say, and I can show you some pictures about it later on, is that it is a, really an issue, sustainability transformation, when we talk about or we uh, analyze the activities of this regional um, political organizations in the Baltic Sea region. And what I would like to do with you now is to send you in the breakout rooms and that you maybe in the next uh, four minutes discuss what can we do on such a regional level. So the Baltic Sea region, the states, the, um, the, the literal states uh, around the Baltic Sea, what can they do for sustainability transformation? That would be my first question to you. You know that some problems are really global problems and we have to or we need global cooperation, global agreements and so on. We have other sustainability problems that can be solved maybe on local level, but what can the regional level do? That's the question, especially uh, with you to the Baltic Sea region. And as I said, I sent you to the uh, breakout rooms if it's okay for you. And then please discuss in the next four or five minutes what can the regional level do? Maybe if you have experience in the Baltic Sea region, especially uh, when you look at this region here uh, around the Baltic Sea. Okay, and then when you come back, I hope that I have the slides uh, here on the on the presentation.
Okay, I think 
almost all of you are back in the in the main room as far as I see and as you can see now I have my slides uh, now it worked um, just to repeat um, in a couple of seconds so sustainability we have really as a core of cooperation in the Baltic Sea region as I mentioned the Halcom uh, foundation already in the 70s first time that East and West came together um, and also in the EU Baltic Sea region strategy save the sea um, so the protection of the ecosystem Baltic Sea is in the very heart of this strategy you can also find it in some other documents or like you can see here in the Council of the Baltic Sea States vision for the year 2030, the Baltic Sea region among the first truly sustainable regions on Earth. So, and um, I ask you, um, what are the challenges maybe on this way to truly sustainable region, region and especially what can a region do or what can we do on regional level? So maybe you give me some answers you discussed in your um, breakout rooms maybe via microphone or in the shared notices geteilte uh, notizen or also in the in the public chat what should we do on regional level for sustainability transformation region in the sense of baltic sea region for example what do you discussed I see that some of you answer in the in the chat in the public chat. I wait some for some answers there. Recycling strategy, indeed, very important in the Baltic Sea region. A lot of um, examples where they try, or the regional political organization try to organize this on regional level. Um, that could be a good idea to recycle, uh, not on local level only, but not on global level. It's too complicated to, to organize it, but on regional level. And then, of course, the reusable energies, also a question here in the region. When you think, for example, on wind power parks, offshore wind power parks in the Baltic Sea, then again, we have issues connected to these questions that are dealt best maybe on on regional level switch to renewable energies protecting especially animals and plants from pollution eg plastic of course this is also an issue and again you can find some arguments why it's important to deal with this on on regional level i'll wait for some more answers because some of you are uh, still yeah winter beans could also be that's a good idea to to organize this on on regional level mm -hmm. okay if we take the, the famous concept of the planetary boundaries as background for this discussion what can we do on, on regional level or which which policy fields we, we should deal with on, on, on regional level then we maybe see an answer also in this as i said famous famous graph um, things that climate change are of course important um, in the baltic sea region as well what one can say that yeah it's maybe the thing that um that susanna wrote in the in the public chat now a good idea to communicate between regions and the Baltic Sea region could maybe a kind of forerunner for renewable energies in order to fight the climate change and so on so that the region can be a kind of pioneer region for renewable energies or whatever but of course climate change is a global problem and probably um, the region can do something, but we have to solve it on, on, on global level. 
The same is maybe true for atmospheric aerosol loading and so on and so forth. But for example, if you check this, the biochemical flows, phosphorus and nitrogen, then there we can say this is a more regional problem, at least if we look at the ecosystem Baltic Sea. And so um, I would like to, to focus on this issue a bit, but also on climate change and also on, on uh, biosphere integrity. And you will see there are questions that are um, yeah, dealt with on, on regional level and that makes sense to do this on this, on this regional level. Um, in the introduction, I mentioned this HELCOM institution as a very powerful institution for the protection of the ecosystem Baltic Sea. They uh, developed the Baltic Sea Action Plan some 15 years ago. And in this action plan, HELCOM, let's say, acknowledged that agricultural activities are really important and this nitrogen and phosphorus uh, flows are an issue that we have to deal with on, on regional level. And you can read, for example, here on the it's a, uh, quote from the homepage, agriculture is, ma uh, is a major source of nutrient inputs to the Baltic Sea, contributing to 70 to 90% of nitrogen and 60 to 80% of phosphorus diffuse and almost of half of waterborne inputs to the sea. And so this agricultural, agricultural policy is in the core areas of HELCOM operations. HELCOM has a lot of aims. HELCOM, for example, acknowledge on the state level, on this intergovernmental level, that agriculture is the main source of nutrient input. And they also see in this action plan, this is also a quote from the action plan, and you see here that they already refer to the European Commission and to the agricultural policy. Because, probably most of you know, agricultural policy is uh, dominated by European, by the European level here in Europe, or at least in the European Union. Uh, the nation, nation states cannot do too much. On global level, we have not that much policy instruments, but it's a regional policy. And we see, as I said, HELCOM sees, okay, we have to do something, but probably the way we have to do it uh, is via this European uh, policy. HECOM recommends a lot of things in this field. They recommend, for example, uh, special constructions for manual storage in the Baltic Sea region and so on and so forth. But these are only recommendations. And the hard policy instrument is really the common agricultural policy. And what they also recommend in the examples in the in this plan is to establish wetlands yeah in, in the field of farm infrastructures with the argument that the wetlands can act by intercepting pollutant delivery to the Baltic Sea to the ecosystem Baltic Sea and I will explain this in a minute. So we see that on regional level the regional political institutions like Helcom and so on see okay the European Common Agricultural Policy, the CAP, has a strong influence on the ecosystem Baltic Sea. And we can also add, the CAP has a strong influence on peatlands, and peatlands again have a strong influence on the ecosystem Baltic Sea. Why is it like that? Um, peatlands, so most of the wetlands worldwide are peatlands, so with organic soil. And peatlands, we have on only 3% of the worldwide land surface. Um, but we have much more peatlands in the Baltic Sea region. You see it here on this map. And in Finland, over here, but also in Estonia, we have more than 20% of the area um, with peatlands. In no European country, the percentage of peat soils is bigger than in Finland. And all the other Baltic Sea littoral states have also high amount of peatlands. You can see it on this map, a bit more detailed, where the peatlands are. And so you can say the Baltic Sea region 
is outstanding peatland rich. One might say the Baltic Sea is a sea of Myers. All areas that are not white on this map are Myers and Box, or at least they have been Myers and Box in the past. Intact Myers fulfill a lot of ecosystem services. And now we come back to, to this discussion, what can we do on a regional level? For example, I go through this in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the dead plants in, in peatlands are not fully decomposed. That means peatlands store carbon. And researchers found out that a 50 centimeter, something like this, thick layer of peat contains per hectare more carbon than a high carbon stock tropical rainforest, as you can see it here in the picture. And so on this only 3% of the global land area, we have a storage of twice the carbon stock of world's total forest biomass on 30% of the land worldwide. And this is even more important, as I said, in the Baltic Sea region, because we have much more peatlands here compared to the, to the global average. So important for climate change. And we mentioned in the beginning, climate change, of course, a global topic, but maybe also important on, on regional level, especially when we talk about uh, communication between regions. Intact peatlands, intact mires and bogs also fulfill other uh, important uh, functions. Um, they cool the landscape. There's more energy for evapotranspiration, so less energy for heat. And very, very important in the Baltic Sea region, the wetlands purify and protect waters. Yeah? Um, living peatlands or rewetted peatlands increase the regional groundwater variability, also some kilometers away from the mire or the bog, and they purify the water. Um, this is really important for the ecosystem Baltic Sea, the takeoff of nutrients in the river valley mires before the water reaches the Baltic Sea, reduces the eutrophication in the Baltic Sea. And eutrophication in the Baltic Sea is one of the main problems here in the region, and this is a regional problem. Uh, this is not a global problem, not a national problem, but this is a problem uh, that we have to deal with on, on a regional level. So, and you can see here the high retention potential. When you see this example with a mire, you have a quite reduced input of nutrients and nitrogen and phosphorus to the sea. And if you have no mires, then the eutrophication, eutrophication become the problem. Additional ecosystem services that we have, um, wetlands, absorb high water events and reduce peak flows. Very important discussions now in Germany with the um, high water events, um, especially in Western Germany. And the coastal flute mires grow up with the rising sea level. So this is, um, let's say, a natural uh, climate change adaptation strategy. If you have coastal flute mires, they rise up with rising sea level very interesting strategy to deal with the um, climate change that already occurs. And last, last but not least, of course, wet peatlands are important habitats for biodiversity protection. So to sum up, peatland, peatlands ecosystem services are crucial for a sustainable Baltic Sea region. But in fact, Quite often we have the situation of drained peatlands. Yeah? And I mentioned in the beginning, we had a lot of peatlands in the Baltic Sea region, but in fact, at least in the southern shores of the Baltic Sea, most of the peatlands are drained and used for agriculture, yeah? for grassland or even for cropland. And one might say this, this is because we have the wrong incentives by the common agricultural policy. And now I come back to this issue that I mentioned in the beginning, that we have um, the situation that we have to deal with regional problems, but why are the European policy or even worldwide policy? But in this case, European agricultural policy. When we go back to 
um, climate change in the beginning. Then we see, for example, the role of organic soils in the Baltic Sea region for um, greenhouse gas emissions. And it's maybe not easy to understand this graph, but if you see, for example, the inner circle, this is the whole EU, 3% um, of the total agricultural areas in the EU are organic soils. So peatlands that are drained. Yeah? But they are responsible for 25% of the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture in the EU stem from this agricultural activities on only 3% of the surface. And this is even much or even a bigger problem in, for example, Latvia and so on and so forth. And you find here almost all Baltic Sea littoral states in Latvia, 71% of all greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector stem from drained peatlands used for agriculture. And this means that also in, 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 in total, all greenhouse gas emissions in Latvia, the biggest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in Latvia are drained peatlands. So here you see the importance of um, peatland protection in the Baltic Sea region for climate protection. And this is, and of course, also for the other ecosystem services. Sure. Um, and this is because the common agricultural policy gives the wrong incentives. The cultivation of mice on drained peatlands, as you can see it in the left picture, um, when you do this as a farmer, you will get the direct payments. At the moment, for example, in Germany, around 265 euros per hectare per year. Um, and if you do not get these payments, usually you cannot keep your farm alive. So you yeah. You need this payment. But if you go to the right side, you see the guys here that are doing so-called paludiculture, so the wet use of uh, agricultural land, so, or the use of wet agricultural land that way around. Um, if you do this, you will get nothing. Yeah. That's strange, but true. The common agricultural policy defines for what it they pay this basic payments and you will get the basic payments for any agricultural area of the holding that is used for an agricultural activity. So no problem to define both of these fields as agricultural area, but only this is agricultural activity because in the understanding of the CAP, Article 4 argues agricultural activity means the production of agricultural products. Uh -huh. And agricultural products means the products listed in Annex 1 to the treaties of the European Union. And in the Annex 1, mice is listed, but uh, TUFA, as you can see here, is not. So you will get money for this, but not for this. Yeah. Completely wrong incentive. Additionally, we have the wrong incentives also in the so-called GAIX, the Good Agricultural and Environmental Conditions. Um, farmers have to fulfill these conditions in order to get the direct payments and so on and so forth. But up to now, organic soils are not mentioned. Organic matter is mentioned, but only connected to um, the ban of burning arable stubble, but not connected to peatlands. So, completely wrong incentives. That means, when I go back to this slide, um, as you can see here, we have already an alternative, an alternative use, a sustainable use of wet peatlands. This is this paludi culture thing. So, you use the wet peatlands um, and for, for, production, for production, for agricultural activities. Um, but in fact, there's no progress. This peatlands and paludi culture, there are some pilot fields in the Baltic Sea region, in Poland, in Lithuania, in Germany, but not really in, uh, in the whole area. 
So my question, and maybe we do not go to the breakout rooms, but we use this uh, forum here for this guest. What can we do? What can a region do in order to become, to become more sustainable in this respect? What is the task of the society, of politicians, of maybe scientists? What do you think when we know this situation? What do we have to do to deal with this, let's say, on a regional level? Maybe you can give me some, some of your ideas in the public chat. Mm -hmm. So the first, first answers appear in the public chat. Probably every one of you can read it. So Alexander says we have to enlighten somehow. General public, maybe how the farmers decide or what their their options are in this field, as I showed with these two pictures. Right, probably we have to to show that these are the conditions uh, the farmer has to work with. And Ruta wrote that pressure EU Parliament to change to update current regulations. This pressuring could be done by individuals, country governments, regional cooperation bodies. I think a very very important issue. To do, let's say, lobbying, lobbying for the, at least in our view, right things. Um, I think that is really important. I can give you an example later on for this lobbying, how to do this. But I think this is really an issue. Educate farmers on the problem and why certain practices are bad for the environment. Yes, again, I would say they deal with this soil. So if we want to become more sustainable, if we want to have the sustainable transformation, we need the education for the guys that are working with the soil. And the collaboration between the regions, giving people more knowledge about current regulation, maybe even help them to do this. Yeah, again, um, this is a good point uh, why regions are important, maybe, that we have a kind of pioneer regions. And if the uh, Baltic Sea region would like to become one of the first truly sustainable regions worldwide, then, of course, if they are ones, they can say, look at our case, what we have done, or maybe the other way around. For example, we have a lot of peatlands in Indonesia, and to some extent, it seems to be that the Indonesian government is doing much more than the European governments are doing, or the European Union is doing. So um, the learning from each other is really important, and that's why maybe the regions are so important. Yeah. There's still some guys writing, so I'll wait maybe one more minute. I'll check it later on. Um, when you ask me what to do, I would say, yes, all of you are right. Um, maybe some more things have to do to do a current policy in this field. First of all, of course, I mentioned that we have this alternative already, the polluticulture thing, but probably we have to do some more research on this. What can we do when we re-wet drained peatlands? Yeah, that is the aim to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, to create this potential of the, of, of the peatlands to store the nutrients um, for the biochemical flows in the region and so on. We have to revert the peatland, the box, and the fence, the myers. 
And first, of course, we have to check what can we do with this. Unfortunately, in our region, we cannot produce a lot of food there, but we can produce a lot of construction materials, uh, of energy crops, and so on and so forth. And this is what is going on at the moment, especially in the Geiswald Meyer Center. Maybe some of you have heard about it. You can go to the homepage of this Geiswald Meyer Center if you are interested in quite interesting projects, what we can do with crops or with paludi cultures, so with agricultural products from red peatlands. And you mentioned it already in the in the very beginning when I asked you what, what a region can do. And of course, energy is always an important issue. And we have, have already some, say, pilot projects where they use this for uh, this paludiculture products for energy production. And uh, heating plants, for example, in Lithuania, we have one here in the northeast of Germany and so on. So to produce energy, paludiculture could be a really interesting option. And as I said, also for construction materials, for insulation materials, but maybe also to create a whole house in, in future. We have one example here in Weiswald also, a paludi culture tiny house, where all the construction materials from this paludi, uh, from this tiny house, uh, come from uh, paludi culture. So first of all, we have to know what can we do. And then, of course, uh, we have to know in the Baltic Sea region, where can we do? This is, I think, a task for the regional level to analyze where can we do this in the region. And here again, we have such a map of the distribution of peatlands in our region here. This is the Baltic Sea, and these are the literal states around Germany, Poland, the Baltic state, states, Lithuania, uh, Latvia and Estonia, Finland, Sweden, and to some extent, Norway. And we have to analyze where do we have the peatlands. We have to probably to go more into detail, as you can see it here from Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania. Well, where can we all? Oh, yeah, where can we use this peatlands for paludi culture, so for sustainable use? We have the same already done for the three Baltic states. And then we have to analyze um, and these are the first steps. Where we do we have the land? Where do we have the options? What can we do? For example, agricultural schemes in the agricultural policy of the EU. This is what you mentioned with this. Uh, becoming active lobbyists, let's say, for the right thing. Um, to convince the politicians on, on European level, you give the wrong incentives at the moment. And if you really want to be more sustainable, you have to change the system. And of course, this is a hard task because, of course, the farmer associations are probably against it because most of the time they are against some really revolutionary new approaches and so on. But yeah, we can do, we can do it via the national or the regional governments or directly as members or as a citizen of the European Union. If you are a citizen of the European Union, you, you can do this. And here I would say from time to time, and at the moment we have such a uh, time, we have a window of opportunity. For example, this European CAP, Common Agricultural Policy, is changing all seven years around, roughly seven years. So it, at the moment, these changes, these adjustments and so on take place. And so we all can go there and the Glassford Meyer Center, for example, is doing exactly this, what you recommended in the public chat. They are doing lobbying. They go to Brussels, they go to workshops, they try to put it on the agenda with policy briefs and so on and so forth. And indeed, there is some movement, of course, from a sustainable, sustainability policy perspective, maybe not fast enough and so on. But in the new um, EU common agricultural policy, we probably have a new GAIA too. So this good agricultural and environmental conditions preserve, uh, that claims to preserve the carbon-rich soils. We will probably have the eligibility for agricultural payments. So we 
we got it to some extent. Um, for example, I'm also a member there in the Scarford Maya Center. I also went to, to Brussels two times and we went there to workshops. And yeah, we were, I think, quite active in, in putting this on the agenda. And then there will be a new thing in the Common Agricultural Policy, the National Strategic Plans. And here we have a lot of possibilities for the national states to give the right incentive for more sustainable use of this peatland. So the lobbying, the becoming active, what you mentioned in the in the public chat, what Ruta wrote, is I think a really important thing. But of course, you always need some natural science uh, research results for for your arguments. You need, of course, the economics. Uh, you have to know what is really possible from an economic point of view when you discuss these options for farmers. So this is uh, what I would like to tell you today, um, that starting from the perspective of, of the regional level, the Baltic Sea region, you can see that in some regions we have, let's say, very particular or typical issues that are important in the regions, but maybe not important in other regions at all. In this case, one example is the peatland use, the sustainable use of peatlands. And um, if you would like to change something there, and if you would like to go in the direction of sustainability transformation, probably the lobbying is a quite important thing. Okay, so far for the moment, time for questions, time for discussions if you like um sorry again that in the beginning i could not show you my slides but i hope you got the message oops i hope you got the message um, even if you couldn't see the slides in the beginning do you have some some things you would like to know or some things you would like to discuss I see that some of you are writing in the public chat, so I wait again for your comments or your questions. So the first question is from Ruta. Do you consider current state of regional cooperation in the Baltic Sea region efficient? Do the agreements actually translate to actions? I would say it depends. Um, I think HACOM was very successful in the um, delation, in, 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 in the closing down of the so-called um, point sources for nutrient input, for example. They saw that the nutrient input into the Baltic Sea is one of the, as I said, core problems in the region that we have to deal with on regional level. And via recommendations, best practice discussions and so on, HELCOM activities were really successful in closing a lot of hotspots of nutrient inputs. Um, so I think they were very active, they were efficient and they were translated to action. It's much more complicated in the case of the so-called diffuse sources, if we uh, keep this example of nutrient uh, input, so the biochemical flows. Um, and of course, it's much more complicated to, do, uh, to deal with the diffuse sources, and these are mainly the um, agricultural activities, as I showed. HECOM is active in this field as, as well, but I, I hope you, you understand it maybe a bit from my, from my talk. Um, the, in this sense, the problem is that a lot of issues are 
written down in a common agricultural policy. So we have already already uh, really, let's say, effective policy instrument on European level, and that makes it much more complicated on a regional level of the Baltic Sea region to deal with this problem, because there are this 27 member states in the European Union, and you do not have almost any peatlands in, in, in Spain or something like that. So all the politicians on European level from Spain, from, from other uh, countries with very few peatlands are not at all aware of this problem. So there we have much more problems. So to some extent, the problem is that we have this strong regional or uh, European policy integration already that makes it difficult to deal on, on uh, to, to cooperate on, on regional level. Yeah, that, that's maybe uh, the point. It depends on, on the on the field of, of cooperation. Another question is, what would you say? How long may it take to imply a new environmental policy, including the suggestions made? <laughs> if we look at this agricultural policy, I would say, um, so this this issue of the, the relevance of peatlands for agricultural greenhouse gas emissions for this um, purif purifying of the water and so on this agenda setting took place maybe five years ago something like that now we have the new ag common agricultural policy starting in uh, probably in 2023 and we will have some really improvements um, there, and I would say maybe one period more. So in the big, uh, in the end of the 2020s, maybe we have a fully sustainable agricultural policy in terms of uh, sustainable use of of peatlands. So 15 years in this case, maybe uh, when, when you have this highly integrated policy field. Um, for other issues, maybe it takes not so long, but for example, in the in this case of Paludi culture, culture, of course, it is really uh, it takes probably more time than, for example, energy transition, because you always have to transform a whole area of land, and and if you, for example, rewet a mire, then of course, if if this this area belongs to 10 people or institutions and eight agree to do so to revet it but two do not then of course they are the breaks and you cannot revet it without the permission of everyone uh, so it really depends on on the issue i would say in case of paludi culture a lot has been done during the last five years a lot of developments but it will probably take some more time for the large scale implementation. Mm -hmm. Other issues? You can of course also directly ask him or write in the chat again or also use the question field on the right side. But I guess you can also write an email. Yes, sure. If you have further questions. <laughs> sure, I can send you some links and so on. Do they have the email? Yeah, they are, um, the email address is on our, our website oh, yeah. on sustainamwe.de. And um, yeah, but you can also Google him, I guess, um, University of Greifswald and Stefan Ebert. Yeah. And yeah, fine. Thank you very much. For your lecture. So thank you for joining. Sorry again for the no problem in the beginning. Um, yeah. But I hope you got the, my ideas and some impressions for a more sustainable development here in the region. So thanks a lot yeah. and enjoy the summer school. <laughs>